Welcome to this very special episode of A Shot in the Arm podcast. I'm your host, Ben Plumley, and what you're about to see and hear, depending on whether you are listening to the audio podcast version or watching the YouTube version on our YouTube or Facebook channels, is a Zoom recording of a webinar we organized with international and India-based community organizations, as well as San Francisco Bay Area groups, on the impact of COVID-19 on India's LGBT communities. We tried to improve the quality of the Zoom presentation, but our goal was to make sure everyone could be seen and heard, no matter where they are, and no matter the quality of their internet connection. But it's harrowing, and it's deeply moving nonetheless. In the show notes, you'll find links to organizations and other resources that would really benefit from our support and solidarity. Thanks for watching and listening. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to this very special event that is being organized by the Bay Area Global Health Alliance, by the San Francisco Community Health Center, Horizons Foundation, Parivar Bay Area, Frontline AIDS, and Alliance India. My name is Ben Plumley. I'm the host of A Shot in the Arm podcast. Um, I'm also a senior advisor to the Bay Area Global Health Alliance, and I'm also vice chair of the San Francisco Community Health Center. Now, this very special event is also being recorded live and streamed on YouTube, live streamed on YouTube by Dia TV, uh, which is America's largest South Asian broadcast television network. And we'll also be releasing this as a podcast, a shot in the arm podcast later today. So with that, let me hand over to our co-host, Lance Toma, to begin the introductions. Lance, over to you. Thank you so much, Ben. And thank you to everyone for joining us at such short notice to this briefing on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic in India's LGBTQ communities and how we in the San Francisco Bay Area can help by making connections to existing effective responses, particularly as it relates to Indian trans communities with our very own stellar organization, Parivar, located here in the San Francisco Bay Area. My name is Lance Toma. I'm the CEO of San Francisco Community Health Center, our city's LGBTQ and people of color healthcare organization. We are San Francisco's leading provider of an advocate for HIV and related services, primary care and support for LGBTQ people of color, and particularly the Asian and Pacific Islander communities, transgender communities, sex workers, and people who use drugs. You can find out more about us at sfcommunityhealth.org. We're also a very proud member of the Bay Area Global Health Alliance. We have two goals this morning. One, to get real-time information on what is happening on the ground in India about the impact of COVID-19 on LGBTQ communities across the country, as well as from those who are working directly with those on the ground. And two, to identify the most effective emergency responses currently being undertaken, that those of us here in the San Francisco Bay Area through our networks and the community more broadly can support. Our co-hosts will make short introductory remarks and then we will hear directly from Anjali Rimi, the president and co-founder of Parivar, an incredible queer trans South Asian organization here in the Bay Area. Anjali will also be joined by Rachna Mudrabuina from Sital, Parivar's local India partner, specifically focused on COVID-19 relief for Indian trans communities. And then depending on how much time we have remaining, we will open up the floor for questions and answers. Please feel free to put your questions at any time into the Zoom Q&A. Ben will moderate them for us. And with that, let me hand it over to Sarah Anderson, Executive Director at Bay Area Global Health Alliance. Thank you, Lance, and thank you, Ben. And thank you so much, Lance, and to the San Francisco Community Health Center for all the incredible work you do. We are most honored to have you as a member. And just a little bit of background about the Bay Area Global Health Alliance. The Alliance is a Bay Area global health community with more than 50 members from across the sector, 
all the academic institution, major academic institution in the area, NGOs, community-based organizations, and tech, biotech, and other companies and private sector companies. We were really created to connect all of the amazing organizations working on just different aspects of health and global health, as many of us didn't know each other. And we're totally dedicated to building this community, working together to leverage and strengthen the Bay Area as a hub for innovation and to advance global health equity. We are most honored to be part of this event. It's part of a series of events we and our members are organizing. I encourage you to visit our website, which includes a range of resources people may wish to refer to as they consider how best to support the emergency response in India. These include the initiatives taken by our members, as well as the contacts provided by our speakers today in this briefing. So now, with great thanks, I hand this over to Roger Dowdy, the CEO of Horizons Foundations for his brief words of welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for, um, for those, those words of, of welcome and inspiration and the work that you and your, your team are all doing. Um, Horizons Foundation is, 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 is absolutely proud and honored to be um, a part of this and with the, the folks who are on here and helping to bring some attention to um, the, the needs of, of, of uh, people in our community throughout India. Uh, Horizons has been, uh, was the world's first LGBTQ community foundation founded 40 years ago. And for 40 years, we've been connecting uh, donors with causes. Uh, and we have been especially uh, focused in our own work uh, on grant making to grassroots organizations, uh, because we believe that that is where true change comes from. And, and we are there and have been for 40 years to help to support that work. And that extends not only to our work in the Bay Area, uh, but also in work that we do uh, well beyond the Bay Area. Uh, we have been, of course, very committed to the, uh, the fight against COVID. Um, and we're able to uh, raise and distribute more than a million dollars last year um, mostly to grassroots organizations. Uh, I'm just very proud to be partners with everybody who is, is here um, and look forward very much to hearing from um, the folks who are doing the work. And uh, with that transition, um, I will now hand it over um, with pride and friendship to, uh, to uh, Anjali Rimi, uh, who is the founder, uh, as you heard, of, of Parivar, uh, to talk about uh, the situation um, on the ground and about Parivar. So Anjali, over to you. Thank you, Roger. Good morning, uh, good evening, wherever you are, folks. I'm Anjali, may pronounce she, her, they, them. I'm the co-founder and president of Parivar Bay Area, um, the nation's first trans-centering, trans-led uh, South Asian organization that really centers uh, trans folks. I'm gonna walk you through a little uh, quick presentation, if you can bear with me here. Um, really still learning how to use screens, even though I've been on Zoom forever. Um, so Parivar came out of a necessity to really center trans GNCI South Asian folks. Uh, here's a little bit about us. We were founded um, and really supported in our childbirth, if I may say, by San Francisco AIDS Foundation. So we're really grateful for them. We're located in Oakland. Uh, we have three co-founders and I'm currently leading as the president. Our membership has been 600 plus. We've done over 40 events in the community. Our focus is very simple and it starts with our tagline, our queer trans South Asian family. It's about celebrating our cultural identity but not giving up on our gender and sexual identity and bringing all of that together. And some of the key things that we have had to do with the pandemic are around stepping up to start co-found, co-founded and are leading the SF LGBTQ COVID Relief Coalition, uh, where we raised over $160,000 and helped over 8,000 people here as well as back in India. And generous donors and funders such as Horizons Foundation, partners such as the SF Community Health Center, really were part of this conversation and 
uh, some of the other things we believe in and we want to build is about changing the narrative of trans hijra folks and trans folks everywhere. So you won't see in this deck any sad pictures or you, we're not going to talk about the, we will talk about the challenges, but we will give you the solutions around that. One of the key things that comes out of that is Parivar Bazaar, which is a full-fledged e-commerce site we launched earlier this year that sells products that are made, sourced, touched, finished by trans folks that are based out in India, from saris to home decor to jewelry, like the earrings I'm wearing. Um, and we were going to go for a big launch. So coming out of wave one, Parivar was partnering very closely with our four organizations that are part of the Parivar. Um, and I should clarify, I should also delineate that Parivar means family uh, in Hindi and a few other languages. So, you know, it would be remiss if we didn't have our family from India included. So while we have efforts on the ground here, um, like holding trans prioritized vaccine drives as we came out of the pandemic, we started helping the folks in India rebuild, rebuild with uh, trans entrepreneurship, uh, with Aravani Art Project, Trans Equality Society, Motri Sanjog and Trans Vision. And uh, Rachna Mujraboyna, who'll speak in a second here, uh, is part of Parivar since the beginning. Uh, I'm really, really honored to work with her for about uh, uh, five years now. She's been doing excellent work across India for over 20 years. And so we thought we were out of it. We were out of the first wave, we are rebuilding and we are good to go. And then hit, second wave hits. So we started with our, with our organizations on the ground and overnight we had about 20 more organizations reach out because the situation was so dire for oxygen, for hospitalizations, for food, which became the most critical one. And lastly, we did do food distributions, but it, it allowed us to be sp spreading it out and it allowed us to be a little bit more um, aware that our funds are always limited. I mean, you notice that we have existed only since 2018. So our funds are not surplus and they're not flowing. But we did raise 15,000 the first year. Last year, we raised over 160,000. And this year, we are needing 1.6 million. And that's where I think Seetal comes into play. Um, can you see my screen full screen or did it spit out? Uh, all right, uh, so Seetal. Seetal is Save Indian Trans All India Lives. And it is a grassroots COVID relief effort that has now become a strategic long-term plan that we need to address in India. Um, it is spanning across 20 states, 47 CBOs and 53 communities. Wherever you see the little check mark is where we've been able to reach folks at least for one food drive, at least for one food distribution. Each food kit is about um, 1200 rupees uh, to 1800 rupees. So that's like a dollar or two and lasts a person for about 10 days. We've had to split that food kit because we did not have the cash flow um, because our primary source of funding is GoFundMe. And we are yet, we're waiting for those funds to be released because we don't get access to those until after the 25th of the month. A few folks have stepped forward and we have put forward all of Parivar's operating money to take care of this. So far we have spent over $45,000 and we have folks who are doing this work on the ground, trans women primarily, who are going into these rural areas, walking my, lots of kilometers to get to where they need to, whether that's in West Bengal with Moitri Sanjog or in rural Andhra or in desert Rajasthan. Our next phases are all about making sure that we rebuild again. We are not going to give up. The struggles of folks in India are paramount. The LGBTQ community still continues to see a huge amount of difficulty in being and existing as themselves. Um, they have rather challenges that I, I would love for Rachna to add here in a second on being accepted at home. And let's not forget the high, high incidence of domestic violence, as well as those that have control over them. And what we want to also delineate to you is the difference between trans and hijra. Hijra is a very close knit cultural identity and there are specific norms around how to exist within that 
community and even us as trans folks do not have access to some of those communities as we're trying to do this relief effort. So there's a whole level of dif different dynamic that we need to play out to and the respect Rachna holds is really paramount for us to be able to access those communities and support them uh, and have their confidence. Um, you know, the Hijra trans communities are relegated to asking for arms, which are unfortunately coded as begging, but we're not begging, we're asking for arms and giving you blessings. And we were revered as gods and goddesses before the colonization happened. So when you take away livelihood, it really takes an impact on mental health. And we have lost some folks to actual self-harm um, before COVID could even get to them. And what do we want to do moving forward? Um, we want to rebuild. This is what Pariwar exists on. This is what we did when we came out of the pandemic. We had paper plate making machines, eyebrow threading, vocational training classes. Arvani Art Project is all about giving the option to trans folks to walk away from sex work and begging if that's not what they want to do. And um, do uh, become artists with a stipend. You see fruit, uh, when vegetable vendors, uh, sewing machines, that some of the saris, that sari that you see being sewn is actually on our website if you wanna check it out. So we wanna believe that there are problems, but we wanna to strive towards all of building equity, health equity, economic equ equity, information equity, social equity, and housing equity. Trans and Hijra folks are pretty migrant. So right now, we show up in a particular area and there's 200 people instead of the 30 people that we know existed there um, or got the lists and their names. So the that's our goal. It's a long-term goal. And hence, you know, we are really looking into this about building network and grassroots. One of the biggest frustrations that I continue to voice while all of the Seetal warriors do all of this work with a big smile, including Rachna, is that there is so much effort happening in India by big foundations, large corporations with last mile delivery using their networks and infrastructure and technology. And not one person or not one company has reached out or has asked the trans Hijra community, what do you need? Can you please be included? We, uh, we had, I had to go on live on IG yesterday because there is a trans woman who is running India's first trans orphanage intersex babies, trans kids thrown to the streets and she's taking care of them. She had no milk. We had to go on IG and I had to scramble and send her funds. And she's part, she's within our network, but again, we're, we're onboarding her because we wanna make sure that the funds are going to the right place and being spent in the right way. Um, so that is Sital, that is um, what we're doing. It was never intended to grow to this scale, but here we are needing to do for our trans community by the trans community, but we take care of everybody who's marginalized and whose voices need to be heard. Um, I'd love for Rachna um, to jump in and share further as she's on the ground as the chair of Seetal driving the entire operation. She's a tough, tough um, chair, I must say. She's very particular about everything being in order. So um, she spent many, she's, I don't know how when she sleeps, um, but over to you, Rachna. Thank you. A nice seeing you all. Namaste and a rainbow greetings for all of you. So um, when we started this digital campaign, uh, the situation was very worst on ground because the, all the working class trans people and Hijra, Kinner, all the groups have been troubling with all the night lockdowns and night shutdowns, curfews and everywhere. So the main livelihood of uh, trans people who are mostly dependent on begging or sex work have shut down and that's how many people have no income no money with them and they all have been very quickly thrown to poverty so this situation has made added much fire to the worst condition uh, which already has been faced by a uh, trans community so what we thought is like there are a number of issues like uh, the scarcity mm -hmm. of testing kits the scarcity of oxygen cylinders now it has been. When we started, it was a lot of scarcity was there. Uh, the scarcity of uh, ventilations and the scarcity of also quarantine centers. Now, of course, nobody is talking about uh, quarantine centers. It's isolation centers now. So 
<clears throat> what we thought is that we approach the gra- ground communities like what is the need then we address the lot of uh, infection rate is high and they are all home quarantined and because there is a very small space they live in and that's very troublesome and the transmission is in a huge uh, range a uh, higher range and in a small room seven or eight people stay together that's how they are more vulnerable for the inv- to the infection the main task main um, challenge we have seen is that if everybody is troubled with infection who will cook for them where do they get food from and if their livelihood has been stopped where would they get food from then we thought that we should feed our people first we should feed our brothers and sisters strong brothers and sisters and that's how i like i asked anjali for help and very luckily she has chipped in and and we have started this though we have started in covid one first wave also such campaigning and such uh, helping with food kits but this second wave has been so harsh and so inhuman on trans community because there is larger rate of transmission there is larger rate of uh, you know larger rate of like not being taken the issue as in the right way because everybody talk about oxygen cylinder everybody talk about ventilation but nobody talk about the food which has to be paid to the trans people daily so uh, last in the first covid day we got a lot of help including anjali parivar and everything we got lot of help but this time we are helpless because everything has been uh, concentrated on infrastructure emerging the systems for uh, to fight with like ventilations and all these systems infrastructures so what we thought is like we need to we need to escalate and we need to uh, we need to reach more people with our campaigning and that's how we have and larger this and we have we have approached a lot of the donors across the world to help the people and very and 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 it is very pathetic to go daily and and it's it's like distributing food and also listening to the narrations of trans communities uh, which are very painful you know it's it's just you give food that's not enough that won't serve the purpose actually and they are really in worse conditions they have to pay the rents they have to pay for medicines and there are also lot lo- lo- lot of other needs and this is how like we have been now in a very worse condition and and other like civil society uh, uh, institutions are also have been helping like global fund and 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 that's how we have been i mainly have been into the national network of transgender and i approach to them and they in this worst situation have organized themselves and now they uh, they started to you know work on various like on various issues and also coming to the help for various people who are most into the you know rural areas now we want to we want to widespread this campaigning food kits uh, and distributing this food kits because mainly food will be the problem until the Uh, until this uh, curfew and and this until this lockdown has been fully you know lifted up so people need food because people won't if do they daily depend on their daily earnings for the food and now the earnings are almost all zero so we need to feed them just to keep them alive that's what i feel it's important and apart from that we also talking and also negotiating with the policy makers how the vaccine goes you know and 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 many of the transgender people are technically incompetent to access the vaccine because it's all online it's on mobile and if you have to book a slot and and there is like like you no know, a slot they will not be able to book because there is already a 45 slot is going on like age of 45 people is going on which is a very risky uh, group has been treated first and people doesn't know how to book the slots now we are have requested the state and all the policy makers and the health uh you know expertise to make easy uh, so that we can walk in into the health uh, you know uh, service providers and we can get a vaccine so there are people also who have got the first shot we have the numbers uh, like for example in the state where i live 900 trans people have been vaccinated the first shot that's the number shows but there are almost all 10000 people uh 10000 visible hijra and kinder community in my state in telangana they all uh, are now like in a confusion state how to get it and this the people who got first shot are also 
now they are saying that the same vaccine is not uh, is out of stock so these are the things which uh, which are very challenging on the ground and and we have to keep leave uh, alive our people first and then give the treatment go on and get the vaccine to our people and also thinking of their other needs like they should have some they should get some money to pay their rents they should get some ma- money to have their hormones to purchase their hormones and and this is there are needs like people need a lot like trans community and apart from that i want to throw some light on not only trans community but also the lgbt working class communities because most of working class lgbt communities are into petty jobs either into the ngos they have migrated from the rural areas or the tribal areas tribal part to the cities you know mostly densely populated cities and living in a small rooms sharing the spaces these jobs almost all have been shut down everything has been under shut down and the wages and the salaries has been shut down and think of like in such condition where the virus is in a and people are so much vulnerable and if you're not uh, if you're not talking about those communities uh, which which are in such conditions in a very vulnerable conditions then we will be leaving out few people few are people uh, um, who are in most need so in last uh, covid first season also i approached lot of civil society organization we made list of such people and we have gone door to door delivering the you know groceries and medicines also and luckily last and first wave like me, many of the civil society also have donated for hormones donated for medicines donated fruit groceries and that's the thing but now the situation is very 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 dangerous and very heart wrenching because it's and the infection rate is more and nobody asked for like whether what need you what help you need coming to the end one thing i want to throw light is like the mental health needs you know so there is already some trauma and pressure mental pressure going on on everyone during the pandemic and we have non lgbt people have some helplines somebody calls them and asks them daily have you taken the medicine how is your condition but that that thing is not there with lgbt people because the mental health has not been ever discussed and we have recently seen these progressive judgments like the nalsa judgment of transgender people and now the johar judgment of uh, lgbt to decriminalization of homosexuality so during this decriminalization and we are going towards the inclusion and uh, and and talking about diversity and also the sensitivity sensitivity towards the lgbt queer people this pandemic came in this pandemic has entered and and has made worse of people who are mostly marginalized are are on and who are mostly into working class so the main to say is that this mental mental health issues are also needed because there are people lot of people who are suicidal during this and they have been into trauma and suicidal during pandemic recently two days back we have seen a trans woman very young trans woman uh jawman has been committed suicide so that's the situation it's it's the physical and it's the mental and it's the emotional need are more for lgbt queer people across the nation so we are approaching people we are having the data we now have the data because we should have that the the lessons we learned in the covid one are that we doesn't have any data of the people every time we go people are like you know people migrate from one reason to other reason but like so lgbt queer people when migrated will not be recorded will not be taken on the record so that's the problem because for the daily enemies they migrate so now we have we have at least one at least we have at least one record if it doesn't have the record of such one lgbt person we have the record of like a data of the his friend or her friend so that we can approach them at least we can call them and we can ask them what they need so now we are taking i i i i have unfortunately to dive in and make sure we we move on but but a really oh. deep thanks to you for setting us 
uh, setting out the issues that the community faces in such clear, clear terms. And uh, I hope that through uh, Parivar, uh, but also the links here, that if people have questions or further um, points that they want to raise to you, please, please feel free to do that. So, so thank you. You are doing, you and Anjali are doing God's work, and I, I hope you'll be available for questions as we as we move on. But um, I, I now want to turn to the uh, broader international response that has been mobilizing, um, and it is a a huge huge honor for me to uh, invite another of today's co-hosts, um, the uh, Frontline AIDS Organization, which is an extraordinary group. Uh, I confess I've known them since the mid-1990s, um, and Frontline AIDS has been really at the forefront of building community responses to the AIDS response. Um, they've been out here, they've met with Roger, their executive director, the executive director, the incredible Chrissy Stegling has visited San Francisco, met with community-based organizations, including Lance's on a number of occasions. And, and we're also very honored that um, one of their board of trustees, who also happens to be a member of the uh, board of the Bay Area Global Health Alliance is Purnima Mane, who um, I often refer to as my partner in crime, and she's going she's gonna to get me for that. But still, I'm really thrilled to pass on the virtual mic, as it were, over to Divya Bajpai, who is Director of Programs at Frontline AIDS, to talk us through the international response to, inter to India's LGBT COVID crisis, what Frontline has done. Um, and then for her to introduce her colleague, uh, Ashim Chawla, who seems to know everybody on the call anyway, but Ashim is the CEO of Alliance India. So... With that, um, Divya, if I could ask you to unmute and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the lovely introduction, Ben. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. Um, it's a real honour to speak at this event um, and to share what's happening in the global response and give you some examples of some good collaborations that we've had in order to be able to respond. Um, so just to remind you, um, I'm Divya, I'm the Director of Programs at Frontline AIDS. Um, we are a global partnership. Uh, we work with over 100 national um, and local not-for-profit organizations. Um, and we work together to focus on ending AIDS. And my organization based in the UK convenes this partnership, uh, working with partners such as Ashim's organization, um, Alliance India, it's around catalyzing local action on AIDS. So it's a real pleasure to, to be with you today. Let me start personally, you know, I've been, in all the years that I've been working on HIV and on LGBT issues and focusing on India, which is over 20 years, I really have, can't remember a, a situation like the one we're currently in, in India. You know, as a second generation Indian woman uh, based in the UK, I can't begin to explain this overwhelming feeling, this need that I have to do something to respond. I don't think I've ever felt this way to such a degree. Um, and, and I think it's come hearing from family members every day. I'm on the phone to family members, to friends, to colleagues, you know, who are really bearing the brunt of this horrendous second wave. And it's kind of taken over my headspace, my emotional space. It's taken over everything. Um, so just having the chance to speak and to, and to share um, is a real privilege and almost, a, yeah, it's helping me kind of respond in a way that I desperately want to. Um, so, you know, as Frontline AIDS, we've been working and I was working very much since the late 1990s on working with Indian partners, working with HIV. Um, and it started out with helping to set up grassroots uh, community-based care and treatment programs for people living with HIV. And then HIV prevention programs with LGBTI groups and other marginalized communities. And it's such an honor to share the stage with Ashim from Alliance India. He'll give you much more of an idea of the, what's happening on the ground. But what's very clear, even sitting where I am, 
um, in the UK is that there's this urgent need for support. We all feel it. We've been speaking about it. Um, and and what, what's coming across is that what's being provided at the national and local levels, and I'll tell you a bit about what the response has been, it's, it's practically impossible for LGBT groups and other marginalized people in India to access it. Um, I think, you know, uh, Anjali, you spoke to it and, and you know, it's very, it's very clear that it's very hard for LGBT communities to access, you know, the, the vast levels of support that are being sent over to, to India right now. And, and it's not just about the medical support that's being focused on, that's needed. I mean, it's about livelihood, it's about safety and security, it's about food support. Um, and we've been able to mobilize emergency grants um, as frontline aides to support um, these local initiatives through Alliance India and our network of local partners. So thank you so much for opening up this space for us. Uh, let me tell you what's been happening out there in the globe, you know, in the world in response to this. There's been so much global media coverage, and I'm sure you've all seen it. And it's clear that India is struggling, like the UK was not so long ago, to respond to the second wave of COVID, you know, and donations have been flooding in to help India fight this latest outbreak of COVID from around the world. I mean, last count, over 40 countries provided support, including from the USA, from the UK, Canada, um, you know, Singapore, Thailand, you, you know, there's been a lot of, of support, uh, but the focus has been very much on providing funding and donations of emergency medical supplies um, to support what is becoming a collapsing health system in India. So the focus has been on hospitals and medical and oxygen supplies. And um, so people around the world have raised millions for India, but in many cases, um, the money is being held up or is not reaching those most in need. And um, previous speakers were referring to that. And what's not helping is a new law that was passed in September last year, uh, which effectively prevents local NGOs from redistributing donations to smaller community groups. Um, there's a very strict kind of registration that's in place. So to find eligible community groups to be able to provide the funding is, provide, is prov proving to be a real challenge. And Ashim can speak to that um, later. Um, in terms of the diaspora, and I'm a member of the Indian diaspora, you know, millions of us in the UK and the US and elsewhere have mobilized in response to the second wave. And that includes sending emergency supplies to our family members, you know, oxygen canisters, or, you know, um, mobilizing grassroots domestic emergency efforts, doctors providing peer advice to doctors and health workers in India, people pressurizing their governments to provide emergency relief, or in the case of the USA, to lift vaccine patents. And there's many examples in the US, the UK, Canada, where that's happening. And, but yeah, where, where I'm feeling there's a gap and perhaps um, others can correct me, but you know, there hasn't been that focus on supporting LGBT emergency funding in these appeals. Um, there are LGBT-focused emergency fund appeals for COVID, but again, India isn't necessarily specifically, but it's not the specific target. So overall, I think the end result is that out of all the support that's coming internationally, it's focusing on the general public and it's providing medical support and strengthening hospital responses. And not much of this is addressing the needs of LGBT groups and other marginalized communities. Of course, there's many local initiatives and we've heard some beautiful examples just now where LGBT communities themselves have generated resources and responded with emergency support, but much more support is needed. Um, Frontline Aids, um, just to finish, like we have systems in place and we're able to respond through our network of local partners who are, able, who are eligible to receive funds from these government requirements but can provide direct support to LGBT communities. Um, and this is ensuring that, at, that there is continued access to life-saving HIV care and treatment and prevention is sustained, as well as ensuring that the immediate life-threatening impacts of COVID and of the lockdown situations are being minimized in India for LGBT groups. And when the Alton John AIDS Foundation, for example, 
we have a very good partnership with them. And last year they funded us to help manage their second wave of COVID-19 emergency funding. And that was to reach LGBT communities and other marginalized populations. I think that um, in combination with other donors, we were able to uh, disperse around $1 million of community response funding and to uh, across Africa, the Caribbean and Asia. And this is where that combination of EJAF having um, tapping into different audiences alongside our partnership and our footprint and our reach to be able to reach LGBT communities and other marginalized communities really helped us kind of catalyze that emergency response. Um, and of that $1 million that we, was, that we were granting, we were able to grant 62% of that to primarily LGBTQI um, communities, so as well as people living with HIV, sex workers, and people who use drugs. And we were able to grant to over 40,000 individuals. Um, and similar to what we're hearing today, the majority of that funding went to food and shelter for individuals as well as ART adherence support and mental health and counseling support, as well as you know, the prevention of uh, PPE, information about prevention, hand sanitizers, um, and home management and COVID-19. So really what's happening is, is that community organizations are designing, managing, and, and, and delivering these emergency um, support, and we, keep in close contact with them because obviously the situation is changing so fast. Um, so it's about helping them kind of adapt to the evolving situation. Um, so really to end, I suppose, emergency funding can reach those organizations in India who are innovating and responding in real time to the needs of LGBT groups um, in India. And it's a question of knowing how to access the structures that are already in place to get to those hardest to reach individuals. Um, because you know, otherwise there are blocks, but there are ways to overcome those barriers. Um, so thank you again. It's been a real privilege to be a part of this. And now it's a real honor and privilege to hand over to my colleague, Ashim Jala, the CEO of Alliance India. He's gonna talk about what Alliance India is doing, what the challenges are that they're facing, um, on the front line of COVID and HIV and how they are meeting all those challenges. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Ashim. Uh, I was just introduced as the Chief Executive of Alliance India. Uh, we are India's leading HIV response organization in existence for over 20 years now. Uh, we were established by the International HIV AIDS Alliance uh, which uh, is now known as Frontline AIDS, where my colleague Dibya works. Uh, and uh, we are part of the partnership, the global partnership of Frontline AIDS. Uh, as a partnership organization ourselves, uh, we combine the strengths of 250 uh, grassroots collectives across India and the South Asia region. Uh, these are uh, collectives of people living with HIV and AIDS but also uh, groups of people who are, uh, you know, uh, who comprise of the LGBTQ community or are from uh, say the people who use drugs constituency or key population groups generally, sex workers as well. Uh, we work with these communities. We also work with the government. Uh, we work with Indian corporates. We work with UN bodies. The Global Fund is a big ally for us and other donors as well. Uh, and our main objective is to make HIV and AIDS a disease of no consequence. I know we've pledged that we'll end AIDS by 2030, but uh, the stubborn and slow pace at which uh, infections are reducing, uh, that's not gonna happen. So, so we'd much rather be pragmatic and say that we'll try and make it a disease of no consequence. Uh, we have a very strong focus on care and support. Divya started the story many, many years ago. Um, and uh, our uh, emphasis is uh, to support the 2 million odd people who live with HIV in India, so to ensure care and support, ART adherence for them. Uh, and this is also the world's largest community-led 
ART adherence program. So it's quite massive uh, and complex. And we have a separate gender sexuality rights unit, which works on the issues of trans men and trans women, uh, their health and well being in particular. We also run testing and health services for the LGBTQ community, particularly for men who have sex with men. Uh, and, uh, and we also work with people who use drugs and advocate for their needs and use harm reduction principles. So that's us generally, uh, a very brief introduction to who we are and what we do. Uh, COVID-19 has hit India hard, of course. Uh, we all know that from media reports, so I won't dwell on that. But uh, in the beginning of this year, we were celebrating a very easy victory. Uh, uh, in March, I think it was, uh, we were sort of sounding like some magic had happened and and uh, we had done and dusted with the pandemic. <laughs> uh, the health minister announced that we were uh, at the end game of the pandemic. So that was a very dramatic announcement. And all of a sudden, within weeks, the story fell apart and we descended into what is called the COVID-19 chaos. Instead of using the lockdown to bolster our, our, our facilities, our medical infrastructure, uh, we went into a, a terrible, uh, avoidable uh, oxygen crisis uh, and a huge shortage of medical facilities and utter chaos in rural areas in particular, I should say, because in rural areas, uh, so many people have died. I know that uh, for uh, certainty because my wife works as a journalist, so I keep hearing the stories from the ground as well. It's in rural areas, the situation is worse. And the question uh, for all of you then is, you know, especially those of you in the United States, why should you be interested? Why should you be bothered? Well, uh, I would say that uh, you should be bothered because these are human beings and they're getting infected and they're dying. But you should also be bothered because it's in your enlightened self-interest. Uh, because this is a virus at the end of the day. It's a virus and it doesn't uh, you know, uh, discriminate or respect uh, uh, borders, nationalities, uh, age, religion, sex. A pandemic has just revealed how interconnected we have become. And so it's a global phenomenon and therefore you should be worried. Uh, now, uh, the invisible and most marginalized people and the most uh, often criminalized, socially ostracized people are the LGBTQ community. And I'm just uh, thinking about, as we uh, discuss this, I'm thinking about this enchanting sort of moment when I met with about uh, 25 or 30 uh, trans girls, actually, very, very young girls, uh, between 18 to 25, uh, at a Buddhist temple where uh, they, they used to gather. Uh, and uh, when I met them, uh, they were telling me about their lives. Uh, one, that because of the lockdown situation, they all wanted to go home, but they couldn't go back home because of the fact that they hadn't revealed the, their um, feelings and uh, their sexuality, uh, sexual orientation to their folks back home. And uh, they were used to uh, begging or, or uh, taking to sex work for a living, but that was not possible in the pandemic situation and the lockdown situation. And despite all of that, they danced and uh, we sang a hijra song together, which was so beautiful. Uh, and then we spoke about phone sex. And we said, you know, is that a viable option for you uh, in this situation? And they said, no, well, we're not capable of that. That's something for the urban elite sex workers. Uh, we can't even do this. So they still continue to live in the margins. Gay people uh, cannot, uh, you know, in sort of interact because of the fact that uh, uh, their hotspots, they call them hotspots back in India. I don't know what you call them in the United States, but hotspots are not accessible in the lockdown situation. So they're always on the margins of society. I've come across trans women with C-19 symptoms uh, uh, suffering a lot of discrimination at medical facilities, and uh, which basically means denial and uh, sometimes death without diagnosis. So uh, a situation like Rachna has uh, put it uh, is, is a terrible one. As far as our response is concerned, uh, we are fighting, firefighting for the most. Uh, our primary response is, of course, to ensure that uh, nobody dies of AIDS. 
and uh, if this means getting art to the doorstep of people uh, people living with hiv we do that uh, if it means uh, making sure that everyone has uh, you know basic uh, safety and hygiene kits like soap and sanitizers and masks and gloves then we make sure that everyone has that uh, so we've been running very big programs uh, divya mentioned the elton john aids foundation uh relief operations yes that was uh, also carried out by alliance india and uh, we uh, apart from you know distributing food rations to vulnerable communities we also arrange covid-19 testing for uh, the uh, marginalized but the global fund i would say is the biggest ally for our efforts uh, this far uh, recently i don't know if you read it in the news but uh, the us government Uh, made a, a donation of 3.5 billion US dollars to the global fund to fight covid uh, internationally across the world and uh, the global fund has made available 150 million US dollars uh, to india and we hope to get a small bit of this kitty uh, to make our response more uh, to make it run deeper but uh, these efforts are never enough uh, it's never enough to Uh, you know uh, respond to the needs of such a huge country like india what i would say uh, in the very end is uh, that it's very surprising that uh, there is hope uh, despite the chaos and uh, pandemonium that's all around us uh, that you know the the rich and the middle classes who have been hit the hardest uh, uh, their generosity index hasn't dipped which is quite in- interesting and and something that i ponder about a lot uh, so we run a fundraising campaign called end aids india and end aids india has managed to uh, keep itself above waters which means it still continues to break even and we get amazing donations from individuals uh, the elderly especially they tend to give a lot more than others and uh, we are able to use this unrestricted money for emergency needs of the lgbtq community our biggest cheer of course goes out to the large cadre of community workers it's phenomenal i am sure uh, rachna would uh, echo this as well that uh, you know there are people who are willing to go out there in the field not stay at home and feel safe but willing to go out there in the field and uh, do what it takes uh, to put themselves in the firing line and and bring uh, some succor to uh, uh, the trans community and other members of the LGBT. So there's hope i think uh, in this crisis i think there's hope because uh, we deep down seem to care and uh, it seems like we'll survive just because of the fact that we care for each other because we are interconnected so thank you very much for hearing me uh, it's been a pleasure and a privilege and an honor thank you ashim thank you so much and thank you for everything that alliance india does y- y- you know we're going to end this a uh, session on a spirit of hope because i think one of the things that we've learned from the aids movement is that we have no option but to hope we have no option but to do the right thing and um and support our brothers and sisters no matter where they are now there is one question that i think we can answer before we wrap up and uh rachana and uh, ashim i guess it's really uh, uh targeted to you is you know you've spoken about the the pragmatic challenges that many people are facing but have you seen um the uh, government and authorities uh using this as an opportunity to further discriminate against trans hijra and lgbt communities um and uh, ashim maybe i could start with you first and then just ask rachana to comment well sadly uh, yes uh and uh, i wish this wasn't the case but the institutionalized discrimination has only heightened uh during the period of the pandemic uh there are now bigger opportunities in a sense uh for a authoritarian state i am sorry to use these words but uh, yes uh, to, to you know uh, hunt or go after trans women 
to go after gay people to go after sex workers and people who use drugs and uh, and and they are suffering a bad fate uh, they've been beaten up they've been uh, you know stopped from uh, their means of livelihood and it's unfortunate yes but i have seen it Rachana, would you like just to make a couple of quick comments about that? Yeah, the quick comment is, as I previously said in the first wave, we have seen that government doesn't have data. So they don't know how many trans people are there. We have a law, like, you know, old data of 2011 of population census. And based on that, they were not able to reach the community. The thing is, so that's, that's the systematic institutional stigma towards trans people that they are not aware how many people are there, then how will be they reaching the people? You know, so so that we doesn't learn. That's why we have chip in into and that's whatever. We make our own systems. The second thing is like, uh, do you have any stigma and discrimination? Like, so every state have, every state have the discrimination and every state have such a uh, uh, thing, uh, uh, phobias towards LGBT people. But the thing is, like we were, uh, like in the last COVID uh, first wave, we have we have litigated. I am also working with Human Rights Foundation. We have litigated eight high courts, and eight high courts in the, across the country have asked the data and also and have a very beautiful order saying that without asking any single identity, social entity, you have to give food, medicines, HIV, HIV medicines, ART, and everything, fruits and vitamins, everything. Trans people do not have any identity, but you have to give. The thing is, like, we are emerging with the ways of how to be also engaged with repression and also the oppression in our own ways, you know. So that's the situation. Thank you. Well, with that, I know we've had a plethora of questions. Uh, we'll be able to come back to uh, some of these, I think, by text and connect people directly. Um, can I hand over to Lance Toma to wrap us up for this event? Because I promised everyone we would end on the dot of nine uh, Pacific time. And um, thank you all for, for, for joining and giving us time and being part of what will be a family in uh, the response to this. So, Lance, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. You know, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, and especially to Rachna and Ashim, you know, being on the ground, you are brave, brave, brave warriors. You are doing everything that you need to do. We know this, as Ben was saying, from the HIV epidemic and homophobia, transphobia, as LGBTQ organizations, we know this so well. And now with COVID-19, we know that this doesn't stop and it just gets worse. And, and it's gonna take everything. And I just appreciate everyone on this call that is really thinking about how we need to be in solidarity to your point, Ashim, um, that it, it, it's a global pandemic and we will only get to the other side of this pandemic if we are all, all working together and in solidarity. Um, you know, Ben, you shared uh, with us on the chat resources about these remarkable organizations, Parivar, Frontline AIDS, and HIV AIDS Alliance India. You know, this is a crisis um, and it will not pass with the next news cycle. And to make a difference uh, it, and to for us to get to the other side of this global pande pandemic, especially for our LGBTQ communities in India, it will require solidarity and support from us here in the San Francisco Bay Area. In certain ways, many of us we know here on the ground in San Francisco, we are facing some similar challenges. At San Francisco Community Health Center, we are on the streets. We have seen the need to provide food, basic hygiene kits, harm reduction supplies, and of course the mental health support that is so critical. We just know that that is what is taking the lives of many of our LGBTQ community members and our trans uh, members in particular. Um, and so those served by CITL, uh, Frontline AIDS, HIV AIDS Alliance India, we, we, we feel this and we know this well. And uh, it's the spirit here in our San Francisco Bay Area and San Francisco Community Health Center that we welcome everyone and we make sure that those at the margins are front and center. We never leave anyone behind. We know that everyone is family. We do our best to support each other no matter where we live, no matter the color of our, of our skin, who we love, our gender, 
identity, our sexual orientation. I just want to thank everyone who joined us uh, at this briefing, to all of our co-hosts, our magnificent community leaders, uh, and of course, uh, Ben Plumley. thank you so much for, for organizing this on such short notice. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, please, everyone, have a great day, have a safe day, and please be well.